Blue Cliff Record, case nine. A monk asked, what is Joshu? Joshu replied, North Gate, South Gate, East Gate, West Gate. In my last talk of uh, 2020, I spoke about the previous koan, uh, the Blue Cliff Record, in which the master says, all through this practice period, I've been talking and teaching. Tell me, have my eyebrows fallen out? That is, he's asking, as my have my words been the true Dharma? And his disciple Uman replies with this one syllable word, Khan, which gets translated as barrier. Your words are a barrier. But Khan can also be translated as gate. It's the Khan in the Mumant Khan. And that's translated sometimes as the gateless gate, and sometimes as the gateless barrier. And it's the same word that Joshu is using here with North Gate, South Gate, East Gate, and West Gate. Zen teachers often took their name from the place they lived. And in this koan, we have the image of Joshu being the town that has a gate in each direction. In other words, you can enter the town from any direction. Right? But we could say that the most fundamental realization in our practice, most fundamental thing we do here is convert barriers into gates. Joshu is most famous for the koan mu where Mu, literally meaning no, is presented as this kind of barrier you have to pass through or a gate that you have to pass through. But when you're working on it as a koan, it certainly feels like a barrier, right? It's this one word that you absorb yourself in. The teacher can ask you over and over again, what is Mu? What is Mu? And every answer gets rejected. It certainly feels like a barrier you don't know how to penetrate. But at some point, somehow, it happens that you become Mu. Everything becomes Mu. The very question, what is Mu, is the answer to what is Mu. The, the difference between a barrier and a gate dissolves. We hear this kind of transformation over and over again in the verses we recite in the different koans. In the Sandokai, it says,
when you walk the way you walk it, even if, how does that go? If you, even when you, even if you don't know you're walking on it, you're walking on it, right? But if, if you're deluded, you're mountains and rivers away from it. It should say something like, if you are deluded, you feel that you're mountains and rivers away from it. When you walk the way, it's not near, it's not far. You're walking the way whether you realize it or not. And at the end of Sashin, when we chant, the Dharma gate is open and the great way lies beneath our feet, extending freely in every direction. This barrier is converted to a gate and we realize that the great way is none other than our moment to moment life, just as it is. This kind of conversion of obstacles into gates, I think happens at all sorts of levels in our practice. I think we've talked about how the pandemic itself, while an obstacle to our meeting together, has also been this gateway to a much bigger, more diverse international Sangha. What blocks one thing opens another. And I was talking to an old friend the other day Uh, someone who's off, also a doctor, but uh, a few years older than I am. And he's uh, someone who is uh, an enormously accomplished and dedicated physician uh, who really has thrown himself into his uh, work practice, uh, helping people. And yet he's now at an age because of uh, various physical limitations and his age itself, he has to slow down. He can't dedicate himself to helping others the way he has had his whole life. And it feels like a terrible obstacle to him. He can't be himself. And yet when we talked a little bit he acknowledged that he grew up feeling very unloved, very unworthy. And that part of what drove him into medicine and helping people was this kind of redemptive curative fantasy that he would become a good person. He would help others he would finally be worthy and lovable himself. And in uh, 50 or more years of uh, practice, that certainly has happened. He is a, a beloved figure by many of his patients. And yet now he's coming up to this point where he's not gonna be able to do that anymore. And he's going to be back in the position he was when he was a small child. Am I worthy? Am I lovable? If I'm not helping others, if I'm not always giving, if I'm not always playing this bodhisattva, what, who am I? What is my life worth? See, I think that kind of obstacle is potentially a uh, great gate in which he can discover that in his old age, he has the same worth that he really did as a small child. A baby shouldn't have to prove its value or its worth or its lovability. 
Neither should an old man. He's not just what he does for others, who he is himself. So that's at a kind of psychological level, how a barrier in our life can open us up to something that's been closed off by the seeming success of our curative fantasy or our whole sense of of self that we've worked so hard to build up and accomplish. At a more basic level, regardless of the content, we go through our life or through Seshin, as Joko said, chronically in this state of judgment of distancing, whether through anxiety or anger or disapproval, constantly saying, this is not it, treating the moment as a barrier. Joko's teaching was constantly to look at the anxiety, look at the anger, look at the bodily tension, not as the barrier to how I wish I was feeling, but the gate to this moment. This is me, this is now. This is the absolute. But our usual way of being is to see ourselves surrounded by barriers rather than in the presence of gates. And that's our basic practice over and over again, moment after moment in a session like this, is to come up against each moment that's a barrier and say yes to it, treat it as a gate. I was thinking that a good book of Teishos could be made of a cover that had that one ideogram for Khan on the surface. And under it, you know, the title would be Barrier or Gate, the teachings of the Duck Rabbit Roshi. <laughs> That's our basic uh, teaching, that Duck Rabbit transformation. That's really what that is. The, the gate barrier duck rabbit switch. The change in perspective where we see something that's been there all along in a different light. And certainly the teacher himself is the ultimate duck rabbit. Uh, where students always have to go back and forth from the perspective of this ordinary person versus this embodiment of the Dharma. Are those things the same or different? Is the teacher's humanness a barrier or a gate? Is the Dharma something different from that. Where else are you going to find it except in human beings and in ordinary moments? So I think Duck Rabbit might be a good Dharma name for me. None of this uh, empty cloud or compassionate dragon stuff, you know. <laughs> Dharma name would be Duck Rabbit. I like that. <laughs> All right. Thank you.